Hey everybody, Techie 101 here, and in today's video, we're gonna be doing some SBS action. Woo! I don't know why I chose to announce it like that, but woo! All right, so uh, taking a look at Volume 89 this time, which was uh, recently released in Japan on June 2nd, I believe. Uh, but before I even get into the SBS, I just I have to admire the artwork here. Isn't it nice? Like it's one of the few instances where Oda just directly takes a scene from the manga and then just adapts that into the Tonkobon cover. Usually, how Oda does it is he'll draw a particular uh, panel or a scene that's just for the Tonkobon, um, usually including a bunch of the characters that appear in that volume, like. Some of my favorites are like Volume 53, which is the Amazon Lily arc. You know, it has Luffy there, and he's following Rayleigh's Viva card, and he's walking on top of the snakes, and the snakes are all multicolored, and the Hancock siblings are in the back. It's just a, it's a very vibrant, very colorful cover. It just, you know, grabs your attention. Uh, another one I really like is Volume 48 for its simplicity. It just has oars and Luffy screaming on it, but it's, it's very impactful. You know, grabs your attention. So yeah, in this case though, he just took the final clash between Luffy and Katakuri in their fight, and just you know, adapted that into the Tonka Bond. You know, he messed with the perspective a bit, but it's still a really good one. I like how the logo of One Piece is the design of the mirror world and how the mirrors are like of Luffy and Katakuri's faces. Just really cool. Um, and uh, there was a lot of other stuff that happened in this volume too, but I'm glad they went with this. But yeah, I I'm just gushing about that. Let's get to the actual questions. So our first question comes to us from Dory, and it's uh, Nami-san called Caesar scum and garbage, and also told him that it would be better if he died. Did she get influenced by Robin's potty mouth or her toxic tongue? Um, I knew the answer to this without even reading Oda's response, because all the stuff that Nami says about Caesar, it's completely warranted. It seems to imply, like, man, she's not really being nice to Caesar. Like, yeah, because he doesn't deserve it. I know that Caesar has kind of been played up as like a whipping boy or like a comic relief character in the last few arcs like in Totland and, and, and Dressrosa where he's like being bullied by the Straw Hats or by Beige or by Big Mom or, or Para Sparrow or somebody and he's the entire time he's just like please I just want to get out of here just give me my heart so I can get out of here my life was so much better before this I'm like yeah it was better for you he kidnapped children he subjected them to a bunch of different experiments giving them illicit drugs that turned them into giants like a advanced form of like gigantism or something by the way there's no guarantee that they're going to be able to get cured from that maybe vegapunk will figure something out i hope he does but it's not a guarantee um they were so addicted to these drugs which by the way caesar passed off as candy to them have some candy kids yeah it's a drug that you get violently addicted to and the withdrawal symptoms cause you to go into intense bouts of shakes and pains and seizures and you also cough up blood yeah that's great. Um, treated his own subordinates like trash, but pretended like they were very uh, valuable to him. Uh, oh, and the whole mass genocide weapon thing. I mean, yeah, the Shiro Kuni doesn't really kill people. Actually, if you go back and look at how Caesar makes his death weapons, they're really not all that great at being death weapons. <laughs> Like, Shiro Kuni looks kind of badass, like it's this giant cloud that covers an entire island and petrifies people, but then you find out that the petrified people don't actually die, you can revive them. Um, that, uh, that Kuro gas that he created for, uh, you know, that, that he gave to Kaido and that, that Jack used on Zo, it was like something like 48 hours before the people actually died, you know, and so as long as a cure is administered beforehand, they'll be okay. Now. Some people had said, well, Caesar's all about, like, the sadism, right? He's all about, like, torturing people, so he's not gonna make a gas weapon that kills you right away. I'm like, alright, that's fine for Caesar, but good luck trying to sell your mass slaughter weapons with that prior knowledge. Like, yeah, I'm gonna hire Caesar Clown to make me a gas weapon to wipe out an entire island, and he sells it to them, and he's like, what, what kind of gas weapon is this? It takes 48 hours to kill people? What the? This is horrible! You know, so, I don't know, I think he's lying a lot whenever he's selling his products, you know? Like, I don't know if Jack actually knew how that weapon operated before he used it. He just probably thought it would be a sure kill kind of thing. I, I mean, I guess it's a sure kill within 48 hours, but it's just a long time, kind of time frame to work with, you know? Um, but yeah, Oda just like, please go back and read, read Punk Hazard. Caesar did all these horrible things, and he actually goes on to say, he truly is a man that would be better off if he was dead. This was a character that he created, and he's like, oh no, Caesar totally should die. Like, that kind of makes me wonder, like, why didn't you have him die then? Like, maybe he will die at some point later on in the story. I mean, 
Oda seems to be okay with that, so yeah. And, and he also goes on to say that even though is only kind, Nami's only kind to people in need that are children that are women, uh, I think she truly hates Caesar from the bottom of her heart, and I think that is totally warranted. Um, you know, even if Caesar actively apologized and, like, bowed down to Nami, like, please forgive me, I don't think she would forgive him after all the horrible things she uh, he did to, like, Mocha and all those other children, so yeah. Um, that's the first question there. Uh, next question, okay. This is a question regarding Luffy and his Gear 4th state in Dressrosa and the whole, like, all the drawbacks to Gear 4th, which I think were, at first I thought they were a little inconsistent, because what happened in Dressrosa is that after Luffy went Gear 4th first to fight against Doflamingo, and then after he did, you know, Leo Bazooka and knocked him into a wall, he deflates... And he, it's implied that he can't move for 10 minutes, and he can't use hockey also for 10 minutes. And then all the members of the Coliseum, all the gladiators and everybody, had to help him out in order to get back to that state so he could deliver the finishing blow. King Kong gun on Doflamingo. So, um, the first thing that Oda clarifies is the whole not being able to move for 10 minutes, that was never, that was never a thing. So... After using Gear 4th and he deflates, Luffy cannot use hockey for 10 minutes, however, he can still move. The only reason why he didn't in that circumstance was because he had people to help him. So he gets out of Gear 4th state and he's all like wobbly, he can barely stand, but he can still move. But then that's when Gats showed up and was like, is there anything we could do for you, Straw Hat? And Lucy, is there anything we can help you with? And Luffy at that moment, you know, he accepted help from others. He probably saw the situation and was like, okay, Doflamingo is really strong. That Leo Bazooka did not take him out. The birdcage is closing in. A lot of people are probably going to die. <sighs> All right, uh, I'll take your help. I'm like, okay, what do you need? I'm like, I need, um, I need 10 minutes to recharge my hockey and then I can take him out. So then you have the gladiators trying to hold off Doflamingo for that long, uh, which is a feat in and of itself. However, Oda goes on to say that even if there was nobody around, Luffy would still be able to move. He would just have to basically get lucky, try his best. He would have to hide behind buildings or go into buildings or just try to stay out of Doflamingo's sight until he regained his hockey after 10 minutes, and then he could try the King Kong gun again. Uh, it's one of those circumstances where it might have worked, it might not have worked. In fact, here's where I get into an issue with translations, because the initial translation I read for this question, just Oda flat out stated that he still would, uh, Luffy still would have won, even without the help. This version on the wiki just says that Luffy would just have to try his best. I think that fits more than the first translation, um, because it's kind of leaving it up to debate, like, not whether, like, not a hundred percent guarantee Luffy would have still won, um, but yeah, that's, that's the thing that I have to, you know, wonder if, if he would have or not, you know, maybe if, I mean, Luffy's a pretty lucky guy, maybe he would have, but you never know, but yeah, the whole issue with Gear 4th and, and how he's, like, I think after he uses Gear 4th against, like, Cracker, he's still able to move, and I think a lot of people were kind of like, wait, what? And even in the fight with Katakuri, he was still able to move after using it, so it's like, I thought he couldn't move, but no. Can't use hockey, but can still run around, and that's what he had to do with Katakuri, had to keep jumping in and out of the mirrors, trying to avoid Katakuri until he got his hockey back. All right. So, uh, oh, this is a fun one. Hi, Oda Sensei. There's a place called Oshi Muna Town in Volume 88, uh, which means don't be stingy town. Who is the minister of this island? Okay, so this is another island in Totland that we just found out in the in the recent SBS. I didn't even know this town was mentioned. It must have been mentioned off to the side or something because I, I don't remember it. Um, but this is actually the island where, like, finances are taking place. Like, uh, there's the minister of finances, the 15th son, Noiset, pictured here in the anime, actually, holding a gun to the Germa. But hey, I guess it makes sense that this is like one of the only islands that aren't modeled after food. The other one is uh, Cutlery Town, Cutlery Island on t at Table Town, because that's the place that makes all of the cutlery and the tables and stuff for the island. Uh, but also, I mean, hey, you got to keep track of your finances, right? You got to make sure like to calculate like, OK, well, this is how much flour we took in last quarter. And oh, this is how many battleships that need constructed. And this is the repairs that we need after all the pirates damaged our ships. I mean, hey. It makes sense. You need to have it. So there's a new island added to Totland, uh, Oshimuna Town in uh, the Don't Be Stingy or uh, Kinko Island. Kinko Island. Kinky Island. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the next question pertains to Flampe, and I was debating to even reference this one, but 
there is a lot of information here, so I'll just, I'll bring it up. Okay, so remember back when Flampe was going on and on and on about, like, I am the king of the little sisters, and Katakuri is the king of the big brothers, and all that stuff. People are asking, like, how does that, gar how is that, like, figured out? And Oda states that it's just a bullshit survey that Flampe comes up with. She, she sends out the things, and she's like, you know, please vote for your favorite big brother and big sister, and all that stuff. Um, but it's something that's totally rigged, because people can vote for more than one person. So, you could vote for, like, best big brother, like, you could have votes for Katakuri and Oven, or Daifu you know like be like you can get multiple votes for the same people so it's like it, it's it's completely rigged for Flampe to basically be constantly the big the best big sister and for Katakuri to be the best big brother although probably not after this arc but here are the rankings okay the king of the big brothers Katakuri, Oven, Pero Sparrow, sorry Daifuku, you don't make the cut, King of the Big Sisters, Smoothie, Amande, and Brulee, sorry uh, Compote, you don't make the cut, King of the Little Brothers is Angelus, he's the... He's the guy that has, like, the greaser haircut, the little kid that's riding on the motorcycle. Nugo, I have no idea who that is. And Dulce, I believe, is one of the balloony kind of kids. And then the king of the little sisters, of course, is Flampe! Um, followed by Pudding, followed by Anana. And Anana is, one, is the girl that was talking to Big Mom that one time, that little girl. So, there you go. I don't think it really matters. Probably never going to be referenced again. Um, but there we are. All right, moving on to more important questions, though. This is the one including Smoothie. So, this question really is... It kind of is interesting because Oda, I don't think, usually reveals Devil Fruit abilities or the names of a Devil Fruit in SBSs. I, I believe he's done it before a few times, but not always. Usually he just reveals that in the main storyline, you know? But people were asking him, like, hey, I was reading Chapter 894 and Smoothie grows really big. You know, that moment when she's on the ship and she launches a Getsuga Tensha. I'm sorry, I mean like a water like, wave attack at the Thousand Sunny, and she was really big, I'm like, and her sword is wet as well, like, what's her Devil Fruit ability, what does she do? And Oda comes out and says, like, yeah, okay, so I wasn't able to do as much with Smoothie as I wanted to. That's the downside. He's like, I kinda wanted to do a few more things with her, but it didn't go out. So he just explains that her Devil Fruit is the Shibo Shibo no Mi, and it allows her to become a dehydration human. So, kind of similar to Crocodile's fruit in a way, except whereas Crocodile was a Logia and he could control all of sand, and so Crocodile had a lot of other techniques beyond just draining moisture out of things. He could also, you know, summon sandstorms, and he has, like, the Spada and uh, that, like, crescent blade around his arm and stuff. So, so Crocodile had a lot more stuff to do, whereas Smoothie is just limited to the draining aspect and, like, the absorption, basically like a sponge. Um, so th that's the case there, but he also states that, you know, she, he can, she can use the water she steals to grow larger, and she can add it to her sword, and she could shoot out water jets and stuff, and, um, he, the last thing he adds here is just, she's strong. So, yeah, he, clear that Oda wanted to do more with her, she is a sweet commander and everything like that. Up until the whole new bounties we found out with, like, Luffy's new 1.5 billion bounty, she had the third highest bounty in the entire series. It went Katakuri, then Jack, then her. Um, I think it's like 900-something million berry or something she has as a bounty. So, yeah. Now, remember, the Big Mom Pirates, they're still around. It's not like they've gone away forever. So, we're definitely going to see Smoothie again, and we're definitely going to maybe get a better introduction of her powers next time. But, uh, yeah, I, I made a whole video about Smoothie, and I originally classified her as, like, a Juice Juice Fruit user or something like that. But, no, it's just in a broad respect, it's the dehydration. So, I still go on to explain, like, in detail, like, how her fruit operates. I just kind of got the name wrong in the general nature of it, but you could go watch that video up here if you want more smoothie action. I also had to rename that video because I originally titled it, well, I originally titled it Charlotte Smoothie, the, like, the, 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 the female with the highest bounty or, like, highest bounty, and, and, you know, people are like, what about Big Mom? And I'm like, well, we don't know Big Mom's bounty. We don't even know if Yonko have bounty. So I had to change that to, uh, the, the third highest bounty in the series, but now that's no longer applicable. So I just changed it again to Charlotte smoothie the female sweet commander one piece discussion have fun with it all right moving on okay so these are the fun ones and i'm going to cover these back to back okay these are the ones that kind of everybody lost their shit over it's the ones where oda draws both ace and luffy as they would be if they were age 40 and age 60 so i'm going to cover these back to back they're really pretty straightforward okay so this is how ace would look at age 40 and age 60 
and this is how Ace would look at age 40 and 60 if things didn't really go as well as they would. So basically, if Ace, you know, you know what? I would have loved if Oda would have trolled everybody when somebody asked him, you know, draw Ace at age 40 and age 60, and he just drew a skeleton. <laughs> That would have been great! Come on! That would have been hilarious! Age 40, it's a skeleton. Age 60, it's like a slightly older, like maybe a, like add a few cracks to it. Like, there you go! There's Ace at age 40 and age 60. But no, no, no. He plays it the right way. So, this is the way Ace would look if he obviously was still alive and he continued on his path as a commander of the Whitebeards and became a great pirate everything worked out okay he has some serious hard rocker hair at age 40 and he cuts it shorter kind of looks very similar to Shanks at age 60 um, I'm assuming his hair is probably more gray at this point but um, yeah so he looks pretty badass and then he draws Ace if things didn't work out too well I mean, aside from dying you know but if like I, I don't know um, Ace had to retire from the pirate business, or he's down on his luck, you know, so age 40 and 60 there. And so that, that was really cool to see, but the way, the, the cooler thing, and a lot of people that freaked out over this was when Luffy was drawn in, the, in that fashion. So here's Luffy at age 40 and age 60, if everything worked out okay. And the cool thing about this is, this could very well be like an epilogue of One Piece. Like, after the end of One Piece in like 35 years or something like that, we could have an epilogue where we see all the characters in the future and this could very well be the design of luffy when he's in his 40s like oda could use this to put this in perspective this would be like if kishimoto drew naruto as he appears at the end of the series as the seventh hokage uh but he drew that in like when when the series was only like halfway done like here you go here's what naruto's gonna look like at the end of the series it would be weird you know but here we go um once again at age 40 there seems to be a clear reference to shanks uh and at age 60 a clear reference to garp uh that should clarify right there because i know everybody always likes to question sometimes you know if characters are actually related to other characters like we could find out like garp is not actually luffy's grandfather what but no, it's very clear here that Luffy is Garp's grandson. He's going to look very slimmer to Garp at age 60. And just the amount of power that this figure could have right here. Like, you know, I guess it's time for me to take him down. Awakened 8th gear. Like, <laughs> you know, like it would be so cool. I'm just, I'm so excited just from seeing it. And they're just pictures, but they're really cool. So I love that Oda did that. Good job, Oda. All right, what's next? Uh, there's a question relating to Stanson, and I'm not going to cover it too much because I already I already picked up on this, like when we covered the chapter with the Elbaf and the backstory with Big Mom. Yeah, you see Hyrudin there training at age 18 when he was a young boy. Um, and then in the background, we see another giant who's just munching down on potato chips. And that giant is obviously a little younger than Hyrudin, but probably not by much. Um, this is Stanson, the giant that appeared in the Saba Odi Archipelago arc that was captured by Disco. And in the, in the auction house, and who is now the shipwright for the new giant warrior pirates, led by Hyrudin. So, Oda states that, yeah, kind of through some weird coincidences, um, Stanson, the pirate that, that was, uh, that, I mean, the giant who is a pirate, that was rescued by the Straw Hats back in Sabaoni, is now a member of the Straw Hat Grand Fleet, because Hyrudin is a member, and he's now commanding of this pirate crew. So, yeah, I knew this was Stanson for a long time, but here you go. I guess it's also clarified that Hyrudin and Stanson were, in fact, good childhood friends, because we don't get that from the chapter. It's just Stanson's in the background watching Hyrudin train. That's all we get. But yeah, they were good friends growing up, so there you go. All right, so uh, what is next here? I think that might have actually been all of them. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, that's that's all the questions there. Um, I think so. The only one I really didn't cover was the one where uh, um, Crocodile and Mr. One's favorite foods were revealed. Okay, so, yeah, Crocodile likes crocodile meat and tomatoes, but he doesn't like ketchup. Okay. And we, okay, you know what? I can relate to that because I like ketchup. I'm not really a big fan of tomatoes. I like French fries and potato chips but I'm not a big fan of mashed potatoes, even though they're all made out of potatoes and ketchup and tomatoes, they're all made out of tomatoes. So, uh, yeah, I can kind of get that. And then Mr. One likes raw ham and grilled pork. Um, I like both those things. I'm fine. I'm fine with that. 
Raw ham. When I, when I think of, okay, let me clarify raw ham. That's like the lunch meat you get at the grocery store, right? Like you just go buy like the, I like the honey ham or like the brown sugar ham. That's really good. You just like take it out of the thing and just eat it whole, you know, that, that's, the, that's what I think when I think raw ham. I don't know. Maybe it's just like I cut up a pig and just eat that, you know, if that's the case, that, that sounds kind of yucky in my tummy, but Hey, here's a little trivia fact about Teching 101 before. I don't even know why I'm telling you this, but here's an SBS fact about me. Um, I have eaten straight up raw meat before. Yeah. Um, so I got home from school once. This was back in high school. And my mom was uh, marinating ribs in the fridge. And so it was just a big block of ribs that were sitting in a bowl, um, marinating in a bunch of like barbecue sauces and marinara and Worcester sauce and everything. And I was such an idiot. I just didn't have common sense, apparently. I just assumed those were fully cooked ribs. So I cut off a big chunk of it. I did microwave it, which might have saved me from getting, like, a horrible disease. I did microwave it, but I didn't microwave it for very long. I just popped it in the microwave, and then I ate it. And at this moment, you're probably thinking, like, didn't it taste horrible? Like, no, because I guess because of all the marinara and the barbecue sauce, it tasted fine. Um, I was just like, man... This is really chewy. <laughs> but I ate it all. I swallowed it out. Um, and then my mom later was like, oh, my God, you're going to die. And I started freaking out. Like, we have to make a run for the emergency room. But I was perfectly fine. I, I didn't get a disease. I didn't puke. I, I didn't. I felt fine. I felt perfectly fine. So I'm going to assume, though, it's the microwave that, that saved me. If anything, it cooked it just enough. But... Yeah, that, that wasn't one of my shining moments. But anyway, yeah, thanks for watching the video, guys. And uh, also, unfortunately, my SBS question that I sent to Oda back in March did not make it in this one. But I was kind of assuming it wasn't. I mean, it would be really cool if it did. But hey, consider this. How many questions get answered in every volume? Maybe like 12? I don't even think there was that many in this. Let me just go through and count them really quick. I hope these are all the ones. I hope that none of them got left out. We got one, two, three, four, five six seven eight nine yeah about nine so yeah it's not very many um and imagine how many questions oda gets like on a daily basis like he probably gets hundreds thousands of questions for the sbs all over the world um you know and, and granted though a lot of them are probably questions that oda would never answer in sbs like people asking about like you know what's the will of d or what about the void century who's joy boy what's the one piece you know there's think of how many questions that oda gets that are just like hey oda i'm a big fan hey just What's the One Piece, yo? Just, come on, you can tell me. I won't tell anybody, just tell me. I mean, Oda, you can tell me what the One Piece is. I can, actually, no, 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 no. I don't want that responsibility. Oh my god. Can you imagine if Oda actually is like, he actually sends you a message back. He's like, you know what? I think I can trust you. Here's what the One Piece is. You'd be like, I wouldn't be able to, like, don't tell anyone now. I'd be like, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to handle that. They, they'd have to lock me away in an insane asylum in order to, to make sure I don't get the message out. I'd just be in my padded cell, like, I know what the One Piece is, you know? So, yeah, probably gets a lot of questions like that, but, you know, maybe next time I'll get my question in. Who knows? Anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, this will be Teching 101 signing out.